Well, class, welcome back to session 45 of our study on spiritual gifts. This one is called, What is Your Spiritual Gift? You see, it's going to be a very different session than what you have experienced up to now. Most of the time, I have talked and I have taught out of the Word of God. I've instructed. This time, while there will be some teaching, it's basically applying what I've already taught you to your life. So that by the end of the session, hopefully, you will have a little bit of an idea of what your most likely spiritual gifts might be. We will probably not finish all of what I have planned in this session. And therefore, it is likely that this will be a two-part session, but we'll determine that as we get towards the end of the session. In the last session, I spoke on Ephesians 4, 14 to 16 about the body of Christ in action. And I presented three points, each point related to the last three verses we were studying. Ephesians 4, 14, 15, and 16. In 14 we said, to really have the body of Christ be effective, know what you believe. In verse 15 it was know how to communicate. And in verse 16, it was no where to serve. Well, we are really going to answer that next question, where to serve, along with what is your spiritual gift. But that's several sessions down the line, but we will get there. Would you open your Bibles to James chapter 1, down to verse 22 to 25? It's the only passage we're going to look at in today, this session. But it's an important verse, again a good memorization verse, one to meditate on, and probably one you've heard before. But it is appropriate for what we're going to do in this session. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. Beginning in verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he had heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If you have been with us throughout all 45 sessions to date, you have more information about spiritual gifts than almost anyone else in the church. Because as we talked about before, spiritual gifts is a neglected topic. When you have received information, James says, don't just keep it, because you're going to forget it. Apply it. Use it. So now that you've learned about spiritual gifts, isn't it about time you identify which spiritual gift you might have? You know, God has been at work in your life since before you were born. And He's given you a variety of life experiences. Some of them have been good, and some of them have been bad, but none of them have been by accident. In God's foreknowledge, He knew that you would go through some very good times or some very difficult times. And he took those experiences and he interwove them into his purposes for your life so that all things work together for good, as he says in Romans 8.28. And the experiences you've had, the parents that you have, the schooling that you've engaged in, the spouse that you're married to, the children that you have, all of that is part of God's plan for your life. Nothing is by coincidence. Nothing is by accident. And so, knowing that God has been actively at work in our life since before we were born, maybe it's a good idea to take a look at what has God already done in your life. He's been at work in your life and now is the time to go back and reflect on what has he actually been doing? 
Because many times when you go back and you look, you begin to see a pattern. You know those children's books where they have the dots all across the page and the idea is to connect the dots and suddenly you get a whole picture? And children delight in this because suddenly there's a picture of a bunny rabbit and they've connected the dots and there's the rabbit. Well, what we're going to do is connect the dots. And the picture that will emerge is what spiritual gift has God continually given you opportunities to exercise in the body? What opportunities in ministry has he given you? And is there a pattern there that would help you understand what your place is in the body of Christ? Now, up on the board, I've listed typical ministries in the church. We have wide diversity of churches in the body of Christ. Some of the churches that are represented among the students are very small. You won't have all of these ministries. Some of you go to very large churches and you may have even more ministries. So what I would suggest for both those of you in the classroom and those of you watching by DVD is that you get a sheet of paper, you get a pen or a pencil, and as I'm talking through each of these ministries, you might want to write down what are the positions, the types of uh, positions that are associated with this part of church ministry. Because later, we're going to use that information to look at how God has worked in your life. So in order to understand it, let's begin with church operations. This is anything that allows the church to run smoothly. It might be the greeters at the door who welcome the people. It might be the ushers who hand out the program and assist the person into the seating area. It might be the person at the information area who answers questions for the people. If you are a larger church and let's say you have food service that you provide, it might be the people who serve the food. Or it could be if you have a bookstore, the people who work in the bookstore. It's all of the people who are doing things to make sure that the church runs smoothly. The second thing would be some of you might have been involved with production. Those would be the people who make sure that the lighting is adjusted, that the sound is working, that the props are available, that the scenery is up there, that the uh, marks are up on the stage where everybody should stand. You do all of the things to make sure that people will be able to enjoy the worship service. Programming is the people who actually plan what's going to happen during the service. There are musicians, there are singers, there may be drama people, there's certainly the pastor. In some churches that are more formal in their liturgy, the order of service, there might be a lay person who comes up and reads from a passage of scripture. All of these are the people who are involved with programming and planning what's going to take place on Sunday morning. Care and compassion. This is within the church. This includes people who are poor and they're running out of money. And you have often church benevolence where a church can assist for a short time helping to get somebody back on their feet, getting them up and going again. You have people who are divorced and you have a divorce recovery program that helps people process their feelings and get back to uh, real life and express their grief and then move on. You have people who've lost a loved one. You might have a grief ministry and you help those people. You might have an outreach to people who have some sort of disability. There are all kinds of care and compassion things within the church that people might have taken part in. There's the prayer ministry. Typically there's one ministry in a church where the people who pray love to pray and you submit your prayer request to that group and they faithfully gather to lift up the people in the congregation in prayer. Outreach. This means doing programs outside of the church itself, not for the benefit of the people in the church, 
but reaching out to meet the needs outside the church. The, a soup kitchen where people are homeless and you serve them food. Sometimes it is soup, other times it's meals. Or maybe you have a ministry that helps build homes in your community and then people can live there. You do outreach and support other programs to meet the needs in the larger community, not the Christian community, but the community that you live in. Missions. Many people have a, a special committee, a special group that works on keeping in touch with missionaries that the church supports. Uh, having those missionaries come and talk to your church when they're in town and report on what's going on. Perhaps sending out a newsletter reporting on the mission activities of people that the church sponsors. So these are all some of the ministries. There could be many, many more. These are ministries that are related to age groups and people. Sunday school, children's ministry. Maybe you've taught a Sunday school class or you were part of a special program like AWANA, which some of you don't know what I'm talking about and others do. It's a weekly gathering that helps people, uh, helps little children learn the Word of God. Maybe you've been involved in student ministry. Not the little children, the ones up to about grade five, but the ones who are in grade six, seventh, and eighth, they're in the middle school era, the ones who are in high school, and many people get engaged in that ministry because they love being around students. Some churches have special ministries just for people who are in their 20s. And 20-something refers to you might be 20 or 21 or 22. You are 20-something. And sometimes they have special programs geared just for that age group because it's so important to get off to a good start in life. You're making the transition from being in, in your parents' home to moving out into the world and establishing your own home. And people who are going through the same experiences like to gather together and support one another. Maybe you have a singles ministry where people who have not married or people who have been divorced and they've recovered from the divorce and now are out as singles, they meet and do things together and go on trips or have parties together. Married couples, you might work in a med wedding ministry where your job is to help the bride in particular make sure that she gets everything done for the wedding and that the church is supporting her in her big day. Uh, you might have a ministry to married couples where you want to ensure that they have successful marriages called marriage enrichment, where you help people uh, make sure that their marriage is all it could be. Some churches, most churches have some sort of Bible studies, some sort of small groups, some activity where outside a church, a smaller group of six to ten people or so get together sometimes weekly, sometimes every other week, and they study the Bible and they talk about their lives and they support one another. And then of course every church has their apostles who are looking for new ministries, seeing a need within the church, and then looking for something to start that will meet that need, or being sent out from the church to start a brand new church. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. So, what I want you to do is look at those categories which are really meant to trigger your mind, kind of as a a prop to say, oh yeah, I was doing that. And I'm going to ask you to write down five ministries, five jobs you've had in church at one time or another. And I'll list the first five that I can think of from my time in ministry, just as an example. And then I'll ask you to do the same thing. So the center section will be the jobs that I've had 
in my time as a Christian in the different churches that I've been a part of. I was, I've been a Sunday school teacher and I worked with middle school. Okay, and I have been a Sunday school teacher working with adults. I have been an usher. I have been a retreat speaker where they invited me to come over a weekend and to give messages and uh, a group got together to have fun in God's creation, but also hear about the Word. And let's see, I've also been on the evangelism team. Now, I've given you five of what I've done. I'm going to ask you to write down five jobs that you've had in the church. Just pick the first five that come to mind and most of you will have at least five. If you don't, write down as many as you can think of. So take your pen or pencil, put pen and pencil to paper, look at these categories, look at my example, and list the jobs that you have. I trust that people who are watching by DVD are also writing down their experiences there's a point to why we're doing this that will become obvious in the next few minutes. So I'll just give you a few more minutes to write down the last few things as you think of it. If you're not done, continue with that and you can listen, multitask, while I tell you the next one. Now I want you to put a ch check in the next column next to ones where you say, I had a feeling that people liked my service, that they benefited from it. They might have said something to me, or I might have looked at their faces and I could tell. They, I might have noticed that there was a positive attitude in the room while I was serving. And I would look at mine here and I would say, I know that the middle school children loved coming to my class. Uh, they told me. Middle school kids have no problem telling you what they're thinking. And I find that adults, both by their nonverbal communication and things they say to me, say, that really helped me. Thank you. Uh, once again, nobody said, what a great job I did ushering. People didn't look particularly happy that I gave them a program or led them to a seat. There wasn't this nonverbal communication that, thanks, I really feel welcomed here. Retreat speaker, yep, people told me there. Nobody told me for evangelism. I didn't hear that at all. I preached the gospel, some people responded, but on the whole I didn't feel like they were really served, that they came away feeling positive about the experience. Now you put a check next to yours. This shouldn't take as long, so I'll just give you about 30 seconds more. I can see that some people in our classroom have already finished. Those of you on DVD have the advantage that you can put on the pause button. Third and final question. And please, I know you could go ahead and check yours while I'm talking. Just wait. Follow the process and listen to my reasoning of why I'm checking things. And you're going to put a check in a third column if you can answer yes to this question. When you served, did you have a sense that God was at work? Did you have a sense that somehow God was working through you, that there was something that indicated to you that it wasn't just you doing the work? Well, once again, I would say I saw it many, many times with the middle school students. We put together a newspaper based on the books of Acts like it was the real 
uh, acts and we were reporting on Paul doing his journeys. We put on some plays. They all, I, I sense God worked powerfully through that. Adults, can't say every time, but most of the time I notice that God shows up. We can forget about Usher. I can almost erase that off the, the board. Retreat speaker, yep. Evangelism, nope. Your turn. Look at yours and the question is, when you served in this way, did you have a sense that God was at work? That somehow God was working through you and the things that were happening were not just because you were there, but because God was present. This question might be a little tougher for everyone, but it is important. If you think it might be yes, and you're going, eh, maybe make it a yes. It's better to err on the side of, maybe, than to leave it off the list. Okay, let's continue. Well, it's not too hard to see that this one was not something where God showed up, not something where people were served, not something where I felt energized. Off the list. And while there was some benefit, I came away energized, didn't have a sense people came away feeling like I really served them and I really didn't feel God was in it. I was stumbling and bumbling and I didn't feel like God was working through me. So I'm going to take that off the list largely because I got three on the list that all have three checks. Now, let me ask you this question. What spiritual gift do all three of those experiences have in common? Hmm. Teaching. Teaching. When I look at my life story, and I could put many, many more illustrations, and I, I connect the dots, almost every one of them have something to do with teaching. I'm willing to bet that if you look at your list, you'll be able to identify a spiritual gift that has something to do with your ministry. But just to make sure, in the next session, we'll begin talking about each of the spiritual gifts briefly. And you can look at the ones you have with check marks on it, and you can decide whether or not it's this gift or that gift. Now, between now and the next time, I would encourage you to make a list of more than five things if possible. The more things you can write down, the more dots you can connect and the clearer the picture becomes. If you cannot put down any more, we will work with what you have. You begin where the person is and you move from there. So I hope that this introductory session has been helpful to you, that you have seen that there are places that you served in the church not every one of those places has been energizing for you. Certainly it hasn't necessarily benefited people. And there have been times I'm quite sure you had a sense that God was at work. But other times it seemed like it was just you out of your natural abilities. So please join us next time when we'll continue by looking at the various spiritual gifts and trying to identify from our ministry experiences which gifts were at work. Thank you for joining us.